Desperate to keep the project alive, Jim Floyd met with Transworld Airlines reclusive and eccentric billionaire owner, Howard Hughes. Hughes saw the aeroplane and he was quite intrigued with this uh, uh, one-off aircraft. It was the only air, jet transport flying in North America at that time. And he wouldn't let his engineers get anywhere near it. He took it to one corner of the and roped it off and put guards on it. And he flew the aircraft a number of times. When I first took it down, I expected it only to be there for a week or 10 days. But we worked for six months with Howard Hughes. He was a, an outstanding pilot, I thought. He tended to do his approach as little higher speed than necessary, but this made it possible to very good, very smooth landings, which he liked to do. He never wore a watch and never carried any money. When we'd finish a flight, he'd ask for the time because he didn't have a watch, and we'd tell him what time it was, and uh, we'd head off to the city, and he'd say, I'm late for an appointment. He'd be looking at, for a telephone booth and pull over to the telephone booth, get out and feel in his pockets, and he'd do the same thing every time. He'd feel in his pockets, and then he'd turn to me and say, Don, can you owe me a dime for the telephone? Because he never carried any money. I had a number of sessions with uh, he was engineering sessions, and I remember one in, the, in um, a penthouse at the Beverly Hills Hotel, where we went through a 13-hour session with him, just he and I. And uh, we had all the drawings laid out in the dining room table in the apartment, and he wanted to go through every single nut and bolt on the airplane so he'd know something about it. He was a good engineer as well as a good uh, pilot. And he became besotted with the airplane, virtually, and uh, he tried to persuade the company to build him 30 for use on TWA, his airlines. But uh, C.D. Howe got wind of this and uh, sent a cryptic note to our president to say, uh, any such use of your floor space will not be tolerated. And so that was the end of that. Even after it was cancelled, it still flew for another five years, and so we could see this beautiful airplane flying and doing its stuff all the time, and yet we couldn't sell it. And the reason we couldn't sell it is because C.D. House said we couldn't sell it. When the program was cancelled, the airplane was just cut up, and it was just a real hard blow for me because I, the airplane was so pleasant to fly, and I'd spent so many hours test flying and demonstrating it and enjoying it that I just couldn't go down into the hangar for a couple of days while they were doing all this cutting up stuff and uh, chunks of metal going crash onto the hangar floor. So that was, it, was, it was a real personal blow. I think that when the jetliner was destroyed, that uh, an era when Canada had the tiger by the tail in civil transports had passed. And uh, it, it's, uh, it was just a great shame. C.D. Howe ultimately cost Canada its chance to open the jet age. For Jim Floyd, the experience was heartbreaking. He'd loved working with airplanes all his life. He loved the jetliner most of all. Jim Floyd was born in 1914. He grew up near the A.V. Rowe Aircraft Company in Manchester, England. He started working at Avro as an apprentice at the age of 15, installing wiring, machining parts, building undercarriages and tail fins. Floyd learned about airplanes firsthand. By 1934, he'd worked his way into the company's design office where he'd always wanted to be. He met his future wife, Irene, in the drafting department. They married in 1940. During the war, they worked together on the famous Lancaster bomber. When the war ended, Avro asked Floyd to go to Canada to work on the jetliner. In 1953, he was given a second chance. The Royal Canadian Air Force asked him to create the most advanced supersonic fighter jet the world had ever seen, the Avro Arrow. The schedule on the Arrow was so tight that there was no 
way that we could build two prototypes and then reflect all of the changes into production drawings and tooling. On the Arrow, we had to go for broke and design for production from the word go. And that was an engineer's nightmare because uh, we were pushing in technology. There were a lot of innovative and uh, unique things on the Arrow. We were doing things that nobody had done before, but we had to get everything right first time. The Air Force wanted a plane that could maneuver above the sound barrier. They wanted a brand new engine and a brand new missile system. And they wanted it yesterday. The costs began to skyrocket almost immediately. The team on the Arrow came together really like a, a great implosion because everybody knew of the great things that were happening at Malton and it became the mecca for engineers and aviation workers from all over the world. So we were able to pick and choose uh, the very best people. And rather than just a small team, say 100 engineers or thereabouts on the jetliner that were all learning together and sort of growing up together, we had at one stage to be hiring about 100 engineers a month. And it was a tremendous responsibility. When we started the Arrow project, my hair was dark. And when we finished the Arrow project, it's like it is now. By the mid-1950s, Cold War tensions were escalating. Floyd had no time to make changes in the aircraft's basic design. He and his team had to hope they'd gotten it right the first time. It was an expensive, risky way to work, but it brought together a group of brilliant minds, the likes of which the country had never seen. Those who were there remember it as the time of their lives. Well, I was working on training simulators in Montreal when we heard about a most remarkable airplane that was being built in Toronto at uh, Avro. And uh, this uh, was later to be known as the Avro Arrow. They called it the CF-105, and it was indeed a, a remarkable airplane. And it turned out that they were looking for somebody to uh, work on the simulator. Well, I sort of leaped at the chance, and I found that the simulator was being used for research and development purposes as compared to training and uh, was uh, uh, being used in ways that I'd never even dreamed of. It was an exciting time at Avro. Uh, we knew, I believe, and we were all very conscious that we were working on a world-beating airplane. I think we were very confident that there was nothing else, at least in the free world, that would come close to it. And it was really very exciting for Canada to be a part of that technology. There was definitely a, uh, a can-do spirit at that time that Everybody uh, felt part of a team. It was a tremendous challenge to make the program a success and uh, get the thing known. March 25th, 1958, the Arrow was ready to fly, just as controversy was coming to a head. Critics claimed that the cost of each two and a half million dollar jet was actually 12 and a half million. Canada was too small a country for a program this ambitious. They demanded that the Arrow be axed. And no one on the production team, not even Jim Floyd, knew for sure how well the plane could fly. There was tremendous tension among all 